My name is Paolo Celli, I'm an assistant professor in civil engineering, and my expertise is in the mechanics of solids and structures. Basically what I do is to study solids of any type, including structural systems to respond to applied forces that can be static, dynamic, and so on and so forth. And in particular, what I'm interested in is trying to engineer structures that are unconventional, so that respond to forces in a way that you don't expect, with the idea of creating structures that have new functionality with respect to the current ones that we have. What we care mostly about is designing some structures with peculiar geometrical patterns that have some interesting mechanical characteristics. And the projects that I was doing early on were mainly related to designing the systems to control waves and vibrations. So for example, designing insulating materials that would uh, uh, shield, I don't know, a certain target object from unwanted vibrations or unwanted sound. Later, I started doing more things related to mechanics. So instead of studying the dynamics of systems because waves and vibrations are dynamic phenomena, um, we start, I started with things more related to statics. And particularly what I do right now is a lot related to shape morphing. So I try to design material systems, structures, solids that respond to forces by deforming a lot, by design. Basically what we're interested in is figuring out for example, ways to uh, transform flat objects into three-dimensional objects and trying to understand how do we design this geometry of the solids so that when you apply forces at certain points, it morphs into a certain target shape. I'm interested in this to try to create deployable structures, so structures that are compact or somehow in a certain form and then morph into a different form, with applications ranging from temporary civil structures to uh, uh, components for uh, uh, robots and things like that. At, at this moment, my research is very fundamental in the sense that the things that I do are mainly related to, okay, can we make a system that does this? that has this ship morphing properties and has these characteristics. Uh, uh, but others have explored the applicability of ship morphing systems. Um, and some applications, again, range from deployable structures for space, um, uh, for civil structures, uh, even for biomedical applications, because you can think of stents that are deployable structures themselves. Um, and then you have applications in toys. For example, if you have um, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, my, kids has, my kid has many of these things, um, these pop-it toys. They're basically these fidget toys that you can pop. Those are morphing structures because they're structures, the dome is designed so that when you apply certain force, it snaps into the other configuration and it stays there. I'm using the same principles in some of the structures that I, that I do. The creativity in this field of shape morphing structures is uh, extreme, to the point that sometimes uh, um, geometries, new geometries, new designs are really found by getting inspiration from, I don't know, nature. There is a lot of bio-inspiration involved in this. There is a lot of uh, um, inspiration from art. For example, some structures that have some very interesting characteristics, for example, origami structures. There are some origami systems that have very interesting properties, like the capacity of, uh, uh, it's called bistability, of uh, basically uh, staying in equilibrium in different states. Um, some of these are people just try to see what the properties were for common, uh, commonly known um, origami designs, and they figure out that they were bistable. In other cases, some people have found these interesting properties in uh, uh, patterns from art. For example, there's a famous paper by some, some, some uh, uh, people in Canada of uh, um, uh, structures that were inspired from Islamic art motifs. Oh. So yeah, there is, a, there is a lot of inspiration from art. We, we usually look into uh, um, everywhere for inspiration. Um, the challenge, I feel like in this field, 
is uh, to be a bit less creative and more rational. Because I, I think rational ways to design the systems in new ways are missing. But there are plenty of opportunities to, uh, you know, get inspiration from other things. Yeah. Usually everything starts from with an idea. You have an idea for trying to design a system that has certain properties or uh, will do something that is new. And then usually what I do is try to uh, uh, turn that into a prototype. Something that uh, we can touch, something that we can get a feel for. And uh, usually we have, we have laser cutters, we have 3D printers uh, to try to make that happen. Um, after we fabricate some sort of prototype, then we start getting a feel for its behavior. So we could be doing some simple experiments, applying forces, seeing what happens, how does it respond, does it break? And then we develop a model. So a computer model that can tell us, that can allow us to forego some of this trial and error and instead immediately understand how we need to tweak the design in order to obtain the properties that we want. So I, I love to have this combination of fabrication, which is really hands-on. And I feel like when I look for students, I look for students that have a passion for arts and crafts because it really feels like arts and crafts. And then we do experiments and simulation to close the loop. During my PhD, um, me and my advisor were thinking, and we went to a conference and we were thinking about uh, how can we do some cool outreach activity. Um, and so we were at a mall in San Diego and we passed a Lego store and uh, we thought of this crazy idea of why don't we use Legos for um, our uh, outreach. So basically back then what I was doing is to design systems that attenuate waves and vibrations. Um, and one of the common system is plates, which is like just a flat piece of material with pillars. Uh, and these pillars, have, when, you, when you send a vibration into this plate, what happens is that the pillars interact with the vibration and somehow they attenuate it. Uh, so that's a, a phenomenon that is called band gap uh, in this metamaterial system. And if you have a plate with many resonators and they're periodic, they're called metamaterials. So we passed this Lego store and then we got this idea of using Legos. So we went to a Lego store in Minneapolis, we bought a Lego plate, we bought pillars, uh, we took this in the lab, and we applied vibrations to it with a shaker, which is a device that used to apply vibration, and we measured the vibration in the plate. And we were super surprised that this actually worked extremely well. And we could see in this Lego plate, the same things that people would see in other systems that were made with much more expensive means. Uh, so we started doing the research with Legos. For example, you can create these systems like this one, which is made of hinges and solid parts that, uh, you know, kind of like change shape. Uh, um, so in, in a way, and this I can, I use, for example, to teach the concept of uh, auxeticity, which is basically, usually when you have a solid and you pull on a solid, what happens is that it shrinks in the other direction. Instead, you can design geometry so that when you pull in a certain direction, it expands in the opposite one as well. So this one is a nice way to, uh, uh, to uh, using, using Legos, to show some of these uh, exotic properties that you can obtain in solids and structures if you carefully tailor the geometry. I, I think it is doing, trying to do outreach. Um, it's something that we as faculty are more and more pushed to do. So trying to engage high school students, trying to engage younger students, the broader audience, to show them what we do so that they can get an idea of what research is. And it's not all about wearing lab coats and doing chemistry related things, because I think that's what people think when they think of a science. Um, um, so yeah, I think outreach is the way, um, which could be either trying to uh, develop, you know, short courses or day long activities, hands on activities, I think for high school students or inviting students to join our labs um, for, for however long periods of time. Yeah, so I think those are probably the best, the best ways. Um,
Some of the things of you are related to designing systems that are bistable. And the idea of bistable is that, uh, also, by the way, this is also Lego. Bistable is something that has two stable equilibrium states. This is one, and this is the other. Oh. And you can say that it's stable because it stays in this equilibrium without the application of forces. So I don't need to apply forces for it to stay there. Um, and we use this idea to create more complex bistable systems. For example, we have these structures that uh, um, uh, they're initially kind of straight, kind of beam-like, and then if you snap these units, and they're all bistable units, it turns into something that is more like an arch. And uh, we are starting, we're currently starting the systems, but among the things that we can, we're trying to do is to actually make them a larger scales. For example, this is a, a unit that is very similar to those, and uh, uh, has this property of stability as well. In fact, you can snap it and it goes into the second equilibrium and stays there without us needing to apply forces. And you can think of using multiple of these to create arch st structures that are initially uh, beam-like and then they turn into an arch. And they stay into an arch because of this property. It's like these types of systems um, and uh, they are designed so that when you pull them in certain directions, well, they're stiff, nothing happens. But when you pull them in other directions, they transform into a dome. And then there are ways to tie together the endpoints of the dome to make it stay 